So I normally do a review of the last two weeks and talk about HTML, but since the videos are online, I don't, I don't think it's really necessary to do that. Instead, I, I thought we could just do um, like set up our HTML, like an HTML page in Glitch to uh, play around with CSS um, on that HTML page. So that HTML page could be like our review. If you guys want me to do anything specific, you can let me know and we can um, add that to the HTML as well. So let's go ahead and open up Glitch together. Just go to glitch.com, go to the dashboard. And then we're going to create another new project. Again, just Glitch Hello website, just a basic one. And I'm just going to delete everything. Let's just start from scratch. So then let's create a new file. And we're going to create our index.html file. So you um, always want to have an index.html file um, in there. That's your home page, just the main main uh, uh, home page uh, that you are going to have in your root directory for your website. So you always need an, an index.html file. And then beyond that, for like secondary pages and tertiary pages, they can be called whatever you want, as long as there's no space in between. So make sure that's all uh, one word with no spaces or has like underscores or hyphens in it. As long as there's no space in the file name, that, that's fine. So we're going to start with a blank slate and uh, just have our assets folder, which I don't think you can even delete, uh, and then a blank index.html file that we just created. And then let's just add our HTML, add our head, and our body. Oops. So this is the structure for every single HTML page. You're going to have the HTML open and close tag to indicate that this is an HTML file. And inside that, you're going to have a head open and close tag, which includes all of your like metadata and the title uh, information for your web, web page. And then below that, we have our body tags, our open and close body tags, and everything that we want to be visible in the browser window when we load it will be placed in there. So again, this is the basic structure for any HTML web page. So inside of head, let's add a title. Let's call this week nine CSS part one demo. Okay. So why don't we, why don't you guys tell me what I should put on this website? So what, what should we include? I don't know, just put something. <laughs> <laughs> well, should there be like home page? Well, uh, well, this is the home page. So you we want me to put text uh home page. So like a header that says home page. Home page. Okay, what's next? Uh, aside from the home page, maybe lesson uh for today or uh, class activity. Okay. Like a subhead. So you could say like uh, week nine CSS part one class demo, something like that. Okay. What else? Um, some image. Image. Okay. So let's find an image. Image of what? What do you think? A book or something. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. Again, no wrong, no wrong uh, answer here. Let's do, okay. So I'm going to do right click and save image as. Put it on desktop. Go back. And let's upload it. Okay. Copy. Let's put the book here. Image source equals let's do width equals 200. Sound good? All right, let's add some body copy too, just so we have something. This is a class example of 
how to use CSS on a website for style and design. Yada, yada, yada. Um, does anyone have any other things they want me to add to it? Uh, list. So ordered lists and unordered lists? Yeah. Okay, let's do uh, a list. Let's do an unordered list. And today we're going to talk about color. We're going to talk about uh, typography. And yeah, let's do way up. Okay, and then, yeah, uh, let's do a table too. Sounds good. Play around with the table. It's the table row. And table header. Yeah, header one. Header two. Header three. Let's do another row. Do table data. Let's do one, two, three. Cool. How about let's, let's add a link in here too. Say, I don't know. Let's just Google color and see what happens. Color Wikipedia sounds good. Okay. And let's do a target equals uh, underscore blank. So it opens in a separate window. Okay. So we have one link, a couple of bullets, paragraph, image, header, subheader, table. Are you able to put a background on HTML or is that? Uh, that's CSS. So yeah, we'll talk about that um, in a little bit. And how, how, how will you make, be able to make like the, say if I were to go to, if I'm on a homepage, right? And mm -hmm. I try to click in another, let's say gallery. Mm -hmm. How you how you make it active? Uh, like a, okay, like a navigation to another page. Yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's create another page and do that. It's a good idea. Let's call this gallery.html. Add this file. And let's do HTML, just like before. Head, title, gallery, page, and then body. Then and here we can have um, just a link goes back to index.html and home page. And then another link will be right next to each other, but uh, gallery.html. Yeah. And gallery. I'm just going to add like a little forward slash here so you can see the difference. And I'll copy this and paste it into index as well. Let's do this at the top. You see it at the top. And so for, for a glitch, these links don't work in this. Oh, I guess they do. That's cool. Okay, so now they work. For some reason last week they weren't working. And now when you click between gallery and home page, it's going between those two pages. So let's, let's just add another each one here that says gallery so we can see the difference. Gallery, home page. So again, it's just linking to a page within your own file structure. So if, um, 
because we aren't going to a different website like google.com or dannywu.com. Uh, we're staying on our own website and staying within our own root directory. All we have to do is find where this file is in our own file structure. Um, luckily, they're in the same folder, but just hanging out in the same root directory folder. So you just have to reference it, uh, index.html and gallery.html. But if it was in a subfolder, like a child folder, then you have to reference that too. But yeah, so that's that's how you do that. That's how you link two pages together. Can you create a child folder? Mm -hmm. So let's do a new file. It's called the folder um, uh, portfolio. And then you can call this painting.html or something. And again, this could be called whatever you want. So it does not be portfolio. It could be, it could be a gallery folder. It could be um, you know anything you want to call it that makes sense to what's in the folder. And then again, this HTML file can be named anything you want as well. Uh, and then you just add this file and then it puts, creates a folder with painting.html inside of that folder. So if we wanted to link all of these together, so let me just copy all this from gallery.html, put it into painting.html. So because we, uh, let me just add another link here. Let's call this painting. Um, but this we need to go painting. Let's just do this and see what happens. And let's copy all that and put it in gallery and index. So it's all the same right now. So it's probably not going to work, um, but I'll show you why. So if we click on painting, it says it's not found. So painting.html doesn't exist in this folder, in the root folder, because it's inside of portfolio. So if we're uh, on index or on gallery, then we need to refer to the folder that that's in. So portfolio forward slash painting.html. Click on that, and then it goes to, oh, let's change that to painting. Go. So you click on painting, goes to painting. Click back on home page, not found. So when we're in painting.html, we need to go out of portfolio. So we have to do dot dot forward slash. Same thing with gallery dot dot forward slash to go outside of portfolio to find gallery.html. So now go to painting from the home page. That works. Go to home page and it goes back to index.html. Painting to gallery. That works too. But we didn't fix gallery yet, so this probably isn't going to work. Yeah. So we have to go back to gallery and do portfolio forward slash. So then we go to gallery and painting, and it all works. So you just have to know where this HTML file lives in your file structure compared to all of the other ones. So you need to know if you need to go into a folder or out of a folder based off of where you currently are, what page you're currently on. We, again, this is something that comes with time and practice. It's not the most easy thing to wrap your head around, but essentially all you have to pay attention to is where, if I want to go from index to painting in my navigation, where does index.html live compared to where does painting.html lives? So we see that's in a folder called portfolio. And so we have to go into that and then we can get the HTML file. All right, so let's move on to CSS. Okay, so what is CSS used for? We already talked about HTML and HTML is mainly for the basic content like the text and imagery. Um, CSS is used for the presentation, the style, the design, the look and feel, um, the layout, uh, how things are um, placed on the page on the on the browser window. So that's basically what CSS for is used for. It's, again, it stands for cascading style sheets, so it has style in the name. 
Um, so it's all about the design, all about the style and the presentation. So when talking about CSS, uh, it's really important to think of everything as having like a container around it, a box around it. So all of the different HTML elements you can think of being uh, inside of a box instead of container. And then we can apply styles to anything inside um, that, that box. So we can apply, apply styles to the text inside that box, uh, the color of the text, the background color uh, for that box, um, the, the border around the box, the padding and margin around the box. So anything that is uh, associated with with the box surrounding um, the content, the HTML tag, uh, it's free game to apply styles to it. Um, same thing goes with inline text. Uh, so we can apply styles to the inline box, the, the, the margin, the padding, the outline, the, the text itself, the background. So we could apply styles to, to the inline boxes as well as the um, block element boxes. So it's good to think of like drawing an imaginary box around all of the elements to allow you to kind of remember that you can apply style um, to everything inside of that box, as well as like the perimeter of the box itself. All right. So uh, these are, uh, the this is what CSS looks like. We can attach different rules and styles to HTML elements. So we indicate what HTML element we want to apply styles to. So that's called the selector. So in this case, we're applying styles to the P tag. So anything that has a P tag in our HTML is going to be um, getting th these styles. Inside of the curly brackets, we have our declaration. And the declaration is the style that we're applying to that particular selector or HTML element. So we can have uh, multiple tags uh, getting the same uh, styles, same style rules applied to them. So you can have like H1, H2, H3 are all going to be like uh, Arial, and they're all going to be yellow. So you don't have to have separated um, them if they're all going to be the same. You can use commas to, to kind of chain them together um, if you'd like. So the declaration is made up of two different properties. There's uh, there are two different elements. There's the property, which is like the font family, the color, the kind of uh, title of the declaration. And then we have the value associated to the property inside of the dec declaration. So here we have some HTML. We have a couple headers, uh, a paragraph, some italic HTML elements. So without any CSS, this is kind of just the standard plain uh, looking HTML styling that you would get without any CSS. Now, if we applied some styles to it, so if we wanted to make everything inside of the body tag have the font family, Arial, Verdana, Sans Serif, uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but that you can have prioritize different fonts based off of what is loading loaded on their system. So um, ideally, they would have Arial on their machine. But if for some reason they don't have Arial loaded on their machine, then it would default to Verdana. And then if for some reason they don't have Verdana on their machine, then it would just default to any sans serif typeface that they have on their machine. Below that, we have some uh, styles for H1 and H2 tags. So we're giving it a color that's like a magenta or pink color. Uh, and then below that, we have some styles being associated to our paragraph tag, P. And that is just color again. And this is going to be a, like a grayscale value. So with the styles assigned to it and applied to the HTML, then it's going to look more like this. So we have our typeface. Everything is Arial. The headers are going to be this pink color. And then the body copy, the paragraphs are going to be this like brownish gray color. Uh, what if I have two P tag, but I want to put different font um, type? Mm -hmm. How do I separate them? 
So if you wanted to apply different styles to the same tag, um, like throughout your design, um, you would probably want to use a class. Um, so apply a class to like this P tag um, in our HTML, like the class could be like called important or urgent or something like that. Um, so it'd be P and then class equals important. And then you could apply styles to that important class. So if this, if you wanted this to be like red or something, then you could apply uh, that, that color um, to that, that class, which is then tied to that specific P tag. So for stuff like that, I'd be using classes and maybe IDs. So there are three different ways of using CSS in your HTML documents. There's inline CSS, which is just in line with your HTML tags directly. There's internal CSS, which is in the, the head at the top of your HTML file. And then external CSS, which is the best one to use, and that's the one we're going to focus on mainly in this class, is in its own CSS file, which is then linked to all of your HTML pages. But we'll, we'll talk about each one of these separately so you understand what they are. So inline CSS is just that. It's in line with the HTML tag itself. So you could say style equals, and the style uh, parameter in HTML is CSS styling. So you can put style equals and then a font and background color, et cetera. And you can do that directly in line with the HTML tag itself. So this would look like this in the browser. There's a couple bad reasons when it comes to using inline CSS. So inline means uh, it's a part of the HTML. So if you had, for instance, like 100 different HTML pages and you wanted um, all of them to have a, a font family of Arial associated to it, if you're doing it this way, then you have to go into each one of those HTML files and then uh, type in style equals font family Arial in the body. So it's not very uh, efficient to do that. So uh, it just doesn't, uh, when it comes to large HTML, or when it comes to large websites with lots of HTML files, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have the CSS embedded in the HTML itself. Uh, because if you ever want to change from Arial to like uh, Helvetica or something uh, across the board, you have to go into each one of those files individually and make that change. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to do that. Internal CSS is a little bit better. At least all the CSS is together at the top. Um, of the HTML document, but this, the issue still stands. If you have a lot of uh, HTML documents for your web page, for your website with lots of pages on it, then you have to go into each page to make any sort of changes. So if we want to change Arial here on all 100 pages of our um, website, we would have to go into each one, change Arial to like Helvetica 100 times which doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not very efficient, but it still works. It would look the same if you did it this way. But the best way to do it is using external CSS files and then linking those CSS files to all of your HTML pages. So now we have a linked CSS file here in our HTML document. And then um, all of our CSS is in this styles.css file inside the CSS folder. Then any changes that we made to the styles.css file would then be applied to all 100 of our uh, um, web pages that are associated to our website. So you just have to make changes once to that file and then it'll automatically be applied to all of the pages that are linked to that specific CSS file. But again, it just looks the same. So we are going to be doing uh, external CSS uh, for this class because it's just good practice to do that. It makes the most sense. Um, it's the cleanest way uh, to handle your CSS and kind of separate it out from your HTML. So that's what we're going to focus on in this class. So why don't we go back to Glitch and just create a CSS file where we can uh, add styles to it, um, which will then be applied to all of our pages. OK, so in Glitch, I'm going to go to a new file. Let's just keep it loose just for simplicity. 
call it style.css. Then we have our style.css file here, and then let's link it to our HTML. So we're going to do that in the head. Go to link and href equals style.css. And you can define the type as being text forward slash CSS. And then there's another parameter we need, rel, and define it as style sheet. So it's linked to our index.html. We didn't link it to gallery or painting, but we could do that as well. Then in style.css, let's just make sure that this is working. Say, OK, font family. Call this Arial. Verdana Sans Serif. Okay. So it looks like it's working. Our home page is now using Arial or Verdana or Sans Serif. So again, we created a file called style.css. It's just loose in our root directory. Um, we added this link href equals style.css to our index.html file, again, inside the head taggers, tags, because this isn't something we need loaded in the browser window itself. And then we just added some style to this uh, CSS document. So we know that's linked and working properly. What's the real standard for? Um, it's just an indication that this is a style, a CSS style sheet. OK. Um, I'm not sure what it stands for, though. That's a good question. So if I comment this out, then it goes back to the default uncomment. And it goes back to the CSS styling that we applied to it. But how, how do you just do that? What did you just do? Uh, command forward slash is commenting out sections. And do it again to uncomment it. Can you go to a style that says this? Mm -hmm. So okay. to end the program, you need a semicolon, right? Yeah, so for each line in your CSS, each sec declaration, you need the semicolon at the end to select the period to that declaration. Otherwise, it, 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 the, the code would think that the next line is part of it. Is the space needed on, on between the parentheses? Uh, not necessarily. So you can delete this if you wanted to. So it could be on one line like that. That works too. Right. Uh, but it does that, does it, do, it does that by itself. Is that what it is? Yeah. So just for like, you can say format this file and it'll automatically format it this way. Just because it's easier to, to read. Like if you have 200, a thousand lines of HTML, uh, CSS code in here, if they all are on one line, then it's it's really hard to navigate just visually as a human. So if we had like a bunch of these like that, it's, it's kind of difficult to see what each one is. Um, so it's just easier for us to read it this way. So yeah, the, that format this file is, is kind of nice too, because it automatically formats it for you. Okay. So there are lots of different uh, CSS selectors that we can play around with. So this um, the star icon is universal. Uh, I, I usually use body instead of star, but it's kind of interchangeable. So it, it would apply, the, the declarations and styles would apply to anything on the web page. So if you want everything to be like Arial, then you can uh, apply that font family to um, the universal selector, which is just this little star, or I, I usually just do body. And then there's different types, HTML types. So there's H1s, H2s, H3s, Ps, Li, ULs, you know, you name it, any of the HTML tags, you can apply slot, uh, CSS styles to. Then there's classes. Uh, so um, if you wanted to uh, make like all Ps, Arial, but you wanted just one to be like red or something, then you could apply a, a class to that one p tag. In this case, it's called note. 
And then CSS, the class is represented by a, a period in front of the name. So that's how you know it's a class. You can say like any class that has note attached to it or any, any HTML element that has note attached to it. So you could say, you can apply note to any, any kind of tag. It could be applied to a P, it could be applied to H1, it could be applied to an LI. Then you could just leave it kind of open like that. But if you just want this to specifically apply to P tags, then you say P dot and then the class name. The other thing is you can also do IDs. So in HTML, we usually use IDs to like for navigation to link to one part of our website to another. Um, but we could apply styles to those specific IDs too. And, and CSS, an ID is represented by a number sign, a hashtag, and then the name of the ID. So a class is represented by a dot and then the name of the class. An ID is represented by a hashtag and then the name of the ID. But didn't you say the ID can be only used once on each page? Yeah, so you should only use ID once on each uh, HTML page. It could be used on like multiple pages, but on one page itself, you should only use one ID, um, one unique ID. It's, it's good to think of it like um, for mainly navigation. So we could say uh, we have navigation at the top that says introduction, uh, main, and footer. And then the IDs would be associated to those sections. Um, so you wouldn't have two footers. You wouldn't have two introductions necessarily. It doesn't make sense. So yeah, the, the ID should only be used once and should be unique on uh, a single web page. But that said, you can apply styles to IDs as well. If you wanted to use um, uh, apply styles to multiple things, um, then you would use a class. And then there's lots of other options with CSS with selectors. Uh, I I use some of these occasionally, but not very often. So you could find the child inside of another element. So if you wanted to find all the A tags inside of all the L LI tags, then you could say, okay, LI, and then this caret, and then A. Then it'll look for all LIs, and then look for all the A's inside of LIs. So you could do that, find a child. You can find a descendant, um, which is similar to child, but it's any descendant. So it could be child or grandchild, et cetera. Uh, so look for all the P's, P tags, then anything that's inside of a P tag that has an A tag, that's a descendant. You can apply styles there. Then you could also do adjacent siblings and general siblings. I rarely ever use these at all, but I sometimes use the child and, and descendant. So CSS works, uh, it's in the name, it's called cascading style sheets. So things cascade from one to the next. So we have this, um, this selector here, which is universal. So font family Arial is gonna cascade to everything else because this is universal and everything inside of that is gonna be applied. You can override that by saying, okay, I don't, I don't want H1s to have a font family of Arial. I want it to be courier. So you could override Arial uh, with another font family. Same thing with colors, you can override colors as well. Um, and CSS always reads from the, the top down. So for like italic, this I, we have two eyes with two different colors. It's gonna see green first, but red second, and more importantly, last. So red is gonna override this green. So this is kind of, and pointless to have this here because red is going to override it. But that is only the case if you're not using this important value. So if you're using this exclamation mark important, then whatever has that is going to uh, override the other regardless of it, if it's before or after. So here, all the, all the type should be Arial. All the color should be this uh, gray color, except for Headers should be courier, italic should be red, and um, bold inside of paragraph should be blue because it's important. So this is what it would look like loaded in the browser. Why it's only head one um, has the quotation? So courier new uh, isn't a standard font that isn't on everyone's machines. 
So there's web safe fonts like Arial, Verdana, um, I think Helvetica. Uh, those are all web safe fonts and you don't need to put quotes around it. So anything that's like a not necessarily a web safe font or like a Google font or a font that you would upload, you would have quotes around it, around the uh, name. I yeah. see. Okay. Yeah, but web safe fonts, you don't you don't need to have those quotes. Good question though. So it's, it's just good to remember that everything kind of cascades. The code is read from the top to the bottom. So whatever is last is going to win out. Uh, unless you're using this important tag here, then that's always going to win out. So different styles and declarations uh, can also be inherited. Uh, so here we have body, font family, Arial, color, and padding of 10 pixels. And then we have a class called page with a border of one pixel, that color, background color, and a padding of inherit. So because padding is inherited, then it should be um, taken from body. So because padding is 10 pixels here, then it'll inherit it here for page. Um, so it'll also be 10 pixels. So this is going to be 10 pixels around the body and then 10 pixels inside of the page um, class. So here we kind of already talked about this, but this is just why we use external CSS style sheets rather than internal or inline. Uh, so it's the same CSS file. It's used on every single page. So if you make changes, it's going to be applied to every single page. No, no need to copy uh, any styles from one page to the next because it's all linked to one document. Changes to CSS automatically is applied um, across the entire website uh, because, again, there's one document linked to all those web pages. Uh, and it's also much faster of a load time because we're loading in one document rather than uh, the same code uh, on 100 pages. We're loading it once rather than 100 times. So that's the benefits of using external CSS style sheets. So another thing that you have to consider is that CSS uh, can potentially be different and look different uh, from one browser to the next. So if we're jumping from like Chrome to Internet Explorer, then some of the padding might be slightly different. Some of the, the thickness of the borders might be slightly different. Some of the layout might be slightly different. So it's less of an issue these days because most of these browsers are automatically being updated to the latest version. But if someone's stuck in like Internet Explorer 7 or 6 or just an old version of a browser, then there's potential for um, the latest version of CSS not to be accepted on that version. So some things just might not work as it should, depending on the browser you're on. So yeah, so testing on multiple browsers is sometimes important to do just to make sure that there's continuity from one browser to the next and everything kind of works well. But again, like I said, it's becoming less of an issue these days. All right, so today we are just going to be focusing on color, typography, and boxes um, for just like the part one of CSS. Um, so next week, we are going to be talking about applying styles to lists, tables, and forms. Uh, we're also going to be talking about layout, and then we're also going to talk about uh, images. So today, we're just going to focus on color, type, and boxes. All right, for color. Uh, there's background color and foreground color. Foreground color is basically just the text, the color of the text. So for H1, we have a color called dark cyan. H2, there's a color, there's a hex value, and then the uh, P tag is a color that's RGB. So you have a number of different options of how you define the value for color. So there's some colors that if you just type the word like white or black or blue, or in this case, dark cyan, uh, the browser will know what that is and then automatically convert it to like a hex value for you. Um, hexadecimal values are pretty standard for color in the web. So you're mostly going to be seeing something like this um, and probably using something like that. Uh, but you could also do like if you're comfortable with red, green, and blue RGB, they can do RGB with the values for each color. 
There's also HS, HSL, I believe, which is hue, saturation, and lightness. So there's a couple different options when it comes to color uh, and the value for, for color in CSS. So this is the HTML, oh, sorry, this is the CSS code um, applied to the HTML would look something like this. So background color is defined by background hyphen color. So instead of for, uh, color for the foreground, it's background type and color for the backgrounds. And again, you can apply the same different color values there. Um, and this is gonna be the background for the, the box that contains the um, HTML element. So the body is gonna be this gray color. Uh, H1 is gonna be a dark cyan again for the background. H2 is gonna be, I think this is like a, a pinkish color. And then P is going to be white. And this is what it looks like loaded in the browser. Um, there's also an option for opacity. So you can do um, a opacity for the entire box and all the elements inside. And it's going to be a value between zero and one. So it's going to be a decimal value. So 0. 0.5 is like 50% opaque. If you want to do a background uh, opacity for a color, then you can do RGBA, and A stands for alpha, so that's the alpha channel. So this is going to be, so 0, 0, 0 is going to be black with a 50% opacity. So again, opacity is the box and everything that contains it. And then RGBA is the alpha channel for the color, so it's just going to be the background color. So the text inside of it, if there is any text, isn't going to have an opacity on it. So that's what it looks like. They both have an opacity, uh, so you can kind of see part of the box behind it. Um, so I mentioned before, you can also do HSL, which stands for hue, saturation, and lightness. And hue is going to be based off of uh, the color wheel. Uh, so zero is going to be red, and then it's 360 degrees, and then it goes back to red again. Uh, there's also an alpha channel for HSL as well. So if you wanted to have a transparency or a opacity on the the color itself, you can do that with HSL too. Um, so again, the first is hue, second is saturation, that's percentage between zero and 100%. And lightness is also gonna be percentage between zero and 100%. And then the alpha channel is gonna be a decimal point between zero and one. So this is kind of what it's gonna look like. So a lot of options when it comes to playing with color. Um, but ultimately, it's, it's really just the background, foreground, and the alpha channel or opacity to play around with. So why don't we go back to our um, glitch file, and we'll play around with adding some of that, some of the colors to it too. So let's do a body, let's do a background color for body, and let's do let's do text. Let's do um. Orange, I wonder if that works. Yeah, cool. All right, let's do, uh, let's see, I think that's H1. Let's give that a uh, color of, let's do white. Let's do a hexadecimal value. White is just six Fs. Let's do a background color. Uh, let's do RGBA. Let's make it like, I don't know, mostly red, a little bit of green, no blue, and let's do alpha channel of 0 0.5. Cool. So it's kind of red, but because the alpha channel can do this as one, so you can see that it's mostly red there back and then it has an opacity underneath it. Let's apply a color to the table. Let's do a background color dark cyan. So now that the table has a background color as well. The, you can do grace uh, gradients actually. Um, so CSS gradient. Let's do a gradient generator. So I think it's a little complicated to do it without that generator. 
So if we want to do like that, like gradients, we can do that. And then let's do top to bottom, so zero. Like that, or 180. Okay. And then this is the code that you would want. So it's a little complicated. Let's copy that. And I'll comment this out for now, and we can take a look at that. So this is. Um, so background color, it's just background. So that's one difference. And then linear gradient, give the degree. So if it's like top to bottom, it's going to be 180 degrees or zero. I think this background is, let's see what happens if we, I think this background is like a, a backup for like old browsers. So if they don't uh, support the linear gradient, option, then it'll default to this. Um, and then this is going to be like the first color uh, where it's starting, the second color, and then area where it's starting, and then third color where that's starting. So the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, font families, um, so typography. So to apply a typeface to a specific element, you use the font family parameter. And then you can apply different fonts, typefaces to that font family. So here we have Georgia, Times, and Serif. So again, if there's no quote around it, then that means it's going to be a web safe font so that is going to basically be on every, every computer, every device that it's going to load on. But the reason why, again, we have multiple options here is that if for some reason Georgia doesn't exist on their uh, machine or device, then it'll default to times. If that doesn't exist, then it'll default to any serif typeface on their machine. So we just have like fallbacks for, for typefaces because it's very possible that someone doesn't have the typeface that you ideally would hope they would have on their machine unless you're loading it on the server side for them. So here we have our body is uh, Georgia. Um, our H1, H2 is Arial. And then the credits class is going to be Courier. So this is what it looks like. We have Georgia for the body. So the, this, the text is the Georgia. H1, H2 is um, Arial. And then the credit is courier. So we could also apply different sizes to the typeface as well. So we have font size as the parameter. And then we could uh, pass in different values, um, like pixels or percentages or M values. I traditionally use pixels for type size, but you can use percentage or M values, specifically good for going from larger screens to smaller screens. Uh, so from like a desktop or a laptop computer to a phone, uh, percentages basically change the size based off of the dimensions of the screen that they're looking on. Um, same thing with M's, they're very similar. So this is what it looks like, loaded in the browser. So type scales, you can use anything. You can use any pixel, any points, any percentage, any M value. Um, but there are, there is kind of steps that um, are considered to be visually appealing. So that's why like in Illustrator and InDesign, Photoshop, they have um, the option to, uh, for the dropdown to select a different uh, type size. And it's always going to be based off of, of this, this scale. It starts with like 8 point, 9 point, 10, 11, 12, and then goes to 14. 18, 24, 36, 48, 60, and 72. It's uh, proven to be very pleasing to the eye. It's been around for a long time. So these are kind of a good step range when it comes to the different point size, um, point sizes you're using for your type. So I'd use this as a kind of general guide, but you don't have to uh, specifically uh, stick to it all the time. 
then beyond the web, web safe fonts, you can uh, upload your own typeface as long as it's, a, I believe, a true type or open typeface uh, um, file format. And you have to define it first as a font face and give it a name. Um, and then uh, uh, send where the source is, so where that font fi file lives um, on your root directory. And then once you do that, then you can reference this name throughout your CSS code. So this is a chunk five uh, typeface that we have uploaded to a fonts folder and can use because it's on the server, just like a image or audio file or video file. So if you want to get more creative with the typeface that you're using, you can upload it to the assets folder in Glitch and then use it as well. Um, the only thing with that is that sometimes it doesn't load properly depending on the browser. And it looks like that OTF and TTF um, files load best on all different browser types. Some people use SVGs, WOFFs, and EOTs files. But let's, let's probably stick to OTF and TTF. But so you can have multiple options here for file formats. So they could have like fallback file, file formats um, for like Internet Explorer fixes and stuff. That said, uh, there's also Google Fonts, which is really great. Um, and it's getting better. I think this is an old screen, screen grab. So I think it looks better uh, now, nice, nicer design. But it makes it a lot easier to get um, a uh, more variety of typeface onto your own website without uploading it to your server, to your assets folder, um, or having the TTF or OTF file yourself. So yeah, check out Google Fonts as a, as a really great alternative to uploading um, your own typeface if you want to have something other than like Arial or Verdana or Courier as a, a web safe font. Um, so there's also different styles for type two. So there's font weights. You can do bold. Uh, there's different versions of bold that you can put in like 100, 200, 300 for different weights, essentially. Um, but bold is just like a standard way. You can also say like bolder, I think. Um, so there's a few options there. So that's what it looks like. You can do font style. Um, so italic, like underline, strike through, et cetera. So it looks like, uh, oh, sorry, underline is a text decoration. Um, so text decoration, you could do underline uh, or none. Um, this is useful specifically for like links. If you don't want to have an underline on the link, which is by default, then you can remove that by saying none. So here you can see that this link doesn't have an underline, but the credit does have an underline. Uh, you could also play around with the, um, space in between lines. Um, so line height is the parameter you use. Then you could pass in like points or M values or percentages as well. So this is just kind of opening up the, the, the sorry, the letting, not the kerning um, in between each line. Then you could also play around with the kerning, which is the space in between uh, the words and letters themselves. You can do letter spacing for kerning. So you can again, pass in pixels or M values or percentages. Uh, there's also text transformation. If you want to do uppercase um, or lowercase, you can do that. And then there's also vertical alignment uh, for text and text boxes. So you can do vertical alignment with the text on the top of the text box or the baseline, which is bottom, uh, or text bottom, which is the, the bottom of the, um, the box itself. So here's top, baseline, and then bottom. So the baseline and bottom are similar, but you see baseline is flush with the um, image and um, bottom, the descender is flush with the image of the Y. Uh, you could also indent text. So this is just an example showing that we're place, replacing the text for H1 with this image. Uh, we're, we're not repeating the image, and then the text is um, kind of off screen at negative 9,999 pixels. And then the uh, credit is indented at 20 pixels. This is the image, and the um, H1 value is like off to the side somewhere. Uh, it's good to keep it there if you're doing something like this because uh, it's 
readable by like search engines and readers for people with visual disabilities. Uh, and then the credit is indented by 20 pixels. Um, you could also apply text shadows to text uh, and drop shadows. So this is the spread and the X and Y location and then the color of the drop shadow. So you could play around. <laughs> So you can play around with text shadows as well. You can also apply different styles to like the first letter or first line of a text block. So if you wanted to have like a drop cap or something for the first letter, you can do first letter and make that larger. If you want to make the first line of a paragraph bold, you can do that too. So it's the, the class and then colon and then first letter or colon and first line. And then you can apply styles to that. First letter and then first line. And then you can also apply styles to links, um, not just like uh, on load, but uh, on hover, on visited, on active, um, and then on load as well. So the A tag is again for links and then the colon link is on load, visited is when someone's already clicked on it, hover is when someone's hovering over it, and then active is when someone's click, uh, physically clicking down on it. So here is on load, hover, and visited. So let's play around with some text as well. So let's go back to glitch. So we already added a font family for uh, the body, so everything is Arial. Let's change the font uh, size for the header. Let's make it 32. Also do pixels. I think pixels and points are pretty much the same. No, no, it's different. Uh, why don't we do it? Let's do a Google font as well. Let's get one of those in there. So let's go to Google fonts. So on fonts.google.com, um, let's just select one. Where is the one? Uh, it doesn't really matter. This one's fine. OK, so you have the option at the top to download the family if you wanted to use it locally on your machine. But you could also select this style. So let's select that style. And I should open up this selected family on the right-hand side. Uh, and then we have two options. We have the import option and then the link option. I'm going to do the import option. And then if we copy this, we don't need the style bit, just the import and the URL. So if we copy that, go back to our CSS, and at the top, I'm going to put it right there. And then to use it, we can see that we have some CSS code here. So I'm just going to copy that CSS rules and put it into our H1 for the font family. Sorry, it's everything. There we go. So then it um, applies that font to the H1 at the top because we imported the URL for where that font lives on Google servers. And then we can use ceviche1 uh, with a default cursive if it doesn't load properly to load it on our web page. Uh, so why don't we also play around with like a link styles? So let's do A and then link. This is going to be on load. Give it a color, I don't know, white on load. Okay. Um, I think I clicked on it. So let's do active. And let's give it a color, let's do green. Okay. A hover. Let's give it a color of red. A, oh, it's visited. Give it a color, color pink. 
Cover should be red. I don't know why it's not changing. Um, uh, so this is under the table, right? Yeah, so it should be no, any of these links should be changing colors. This okay. Let me just get rid of some of these and see if that fixes it. Okay, hover works. Just do a and color green. Okay, that works. I think it's because they were all visited. So they were all staying that visited color. But yeah, that seems to be working. And we could do text decoration. There we go. Okay. So then that got rid of the underline. We could change the fonts as well. Okay, it's courier. Uh, what else can we do? We do fonts weight. So you, you can do 100, you can do 800, should get, yeah, thicker. Do 400. So these are just different types of weight, or you can do bold, you can do bolder, no, it doesn't look any different. So yeah, so you can apply all these different styles, all these different typefaces, um, so there's a lot you can do with type in CSS. So you could also do like, a, you can apply hover to anything, so if we wanted to do like table, Hover, say background, color this is green. Then when we hover over the table, it'll turn green too. So you could apply hover to everything. It doesn't have to just be um, a link, for instance. Um, so th those cheat sheets are really good. I don't expect you to remember everything we talked about today. I mean, I don't remember every single little thing about CSS or HTML. Uh, so I have to refer to like the all powerful and mighty google.com to search for examples of HTML and CSS that I just, I kind of like forget. It's just basically a dictionary of stuff that um, you have to kind of refer to or remember when it comes to building um, a website with HTML and CSS and no one no one's very few people have memorized the dictionary. I don't expect you to remember memorize HTML and CSS to its, its completion. So just figure out what you want to do, what you need to do, and then find the right HTML tags and CSS uh, declarations to make that possible. But I don't expect you to remember everything. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about are boxes. So again, with CSS, everything should be considered to have a box around it. Um, so text has a box around it, uh, and then you can apply styles to the box itself, and then also to like the, the padding around the box and the margin around the box, the border around the box, and then obviously the, the content inside of the box. But for the box, we can apply different styles like height and width to the dimensions of the box, so how, uh, how big that box is. Uh, that can be in pixels, so defined dimensions, or it could be um, in, uh, in percentages, which can scale based off of the dimensions of the browser window or the device that they're looking at um, the website on. So here we have just an outer div that's 300 pixels by 400 pixels, and an inner paragraph that's 75% for the width and height um, inside of that div. So this is 300 by uh, 400 pixels, um, and this is 75% inside of that, that box. Uh, here we have a um, description class for our table data tag. 
that has a minimum width and a maximum width. So uh, we can define uh, the minimum width so it doesn't it never gets below 450 pixels. The maximum width never gets above 650 pixels. Uh, so then we could also apply padding and margin and text alignment inside of the box. So it could be aligned left, center, or right. Uh, and then padding is just um, padding around the contents inside of the box. And margin is um, kind of the space around the outside of the box. So here's our description. And if you scale it up or down, it'll never get below 400 pixels wide, and it'll never go above um, what is 650 pixels wide or something like that. And there's a little bit of padding around the text too that you can see. So you could also limit the height. So we have a minimum height here of 10 pixels and a maximum height of 30 pixels. So you can do the same thing um, that we just talked about with width um, as with height. This uh, has a, a border around the bottom as well. So you um, add a border outline around the box itself. You can define like the, the entire border. Uh, you can do just the bottom border, top, left, right, combination of all those. Uh, and then you can define the border thickness in pixels. If it's solid or dotted, then you can give it a color as well. So this, you'd never do this, but um, the minimum height is 10 pixels and maximum height is 30 pixels here, but it overlaps. So it's kind of pointless. But if it does that, you can do overflow content uh, parameters as well. So we have overflow and you can hide all the overflow or you can uh, add a scroll bar to the overflow. So even though it's overlapping, we can hide uh, some of it so it doesn't overlap on top. Or you get out a scroll bar so they can scroll inside of that box itself. So we have uh, with the box itself, we can play around with the border, which is the yellow bit, the margin, which is the green bit on the outside, and the padding, which is the interior padding purple bit here. So you could add different sizes and dimensions for uh, all three of those, so border, margin, and padding. So here we're playing around with border width. So border width is two pixels. You could also, just like with color, you could say like green and blue and white. With um, the border thickness, you can also say thick and I think thicker. And then for, if you wanna apply different thickness to each side, you can apply different, uh, four different values. And it's gonna start from the top and go clockwise. So top, right, bottom, and left. So the top is gonna to be one pixel, right is gonna be four pixels, bottom is gonna be 12 pixels, and the left is gonna be four pixels. So this one just has a solid border around everything. That's, I think, one pixel. This is the thick border. And this has a border that is different on all sides. Um, there's also border styles. So it could be solid, dotted, dashed, uh, double lined, grooved, ridged, inset, and outset. You could do stuff like this. Um, you can change the border color as well. If there's one value in there, um, all four sides are going to be the same color. Just like with um, thickness, if there's four values in there, all four sides are going to have a different color based off of each one of these values. Uh, there's also shorthand with border. Um, so you could say border instead of like border thickness or border, sorry, border weight, border style, et cetera. You can just say border and they'll say, okay, I want this three pixels the dotted in this color. So you can do shorthand too. You don't have to write each one out individually. Um, padding is the space on the interior of the border. So it's gonna give padding around the border between the border and the content inside of the box. So here we have 10 pixels of padding all the way around. So this does not have any padding. This has 10 pixels of padding around the text. Then margin is on the exterior of the border. Um, so the margin, the space around the, the border on the outside, you can apply a value there. And it'll basically give some space from the other content surrounding it. Um, if you want to center your, your content on the, on the browser window itself, uh, you can do, um, and for margin, you can pass in just like with um, border, you could pass in four different values to get each side. 
uh, to have a different value. You can do that with margin two and padding. Um, so here we have 10 pixels on the top, auto on the right, 10 pixels on the bottom, and auto on the left. And what auto means is that it's going to automatically change the margin spacing uh, on both sides so that the content is going to be centered on the screen. So regardless of the size of the screen or the device you're viewing it on, it's always going to be centered on, on the browser window. So that's what auto does. So this is margin auto on the left and right side, and that's why it's centered on the browser window. Uh, so with any of these elements, you could also apply this um, parameter called display to it. And display can pass, you can pass in two different, a couple of different values. Inline is going to display, um, like in this case, all these bullet points. Bullet points are traditionally block elements, so they're going to be stacked on top of each other in HTML by default. But if you apply display in line to the li to the bullet points, then they're going to go in line with each other. So they're going to be right next to each other rather than stacked on top of each other. Uh, you could also say display none. So if you wanted to like hide something um, or not display it on the screen, then you can do that too. And then I think there's a display hide, which hides it, but still um, keeps the box there. So there's going to be like a gap, but you won't see the contents. So here, the, these, uh, these are bullet points. These are um, it's probably an unordered list, um, but its display is set to inline. So instead of being stacked on top of each other, they're in line with each other, which is great for like navigation or something like that. Oh, sorry. So display uh, hidden, I don't think that exists. It's visibility hidden. Um, so this is just saying uh, coming soon instead of displaying none, which is going to hide the box and the contents. Visibility hidden is going to uh, so, um, allow you to see the space where the, the coming soon option was, but the contents is going to be hidden. So it's going to be hit just hidden, but the space is still there. So borders, you could also apply images to the borders if you wanted to do that. I rarely do that, but you can do that as well. So border image is another parameter that you could use and then apply an image to uh, each side. So it could be something like that. And then just like with text, you can do drop shadows uh, with the, the box itself, just a box shadow instead of text shadow. Um, and again, you could pass in the spread, the um, X and Y location, and then the color. Uh, you could also do like inset versus drop shadow on the outside uh, or on the on the back. Um, and then you could also do rounded corners for, for boxes as well. So if you wanted to have rounded corners instead of uh, pointy corners, you can say um, border radius is 10 pixels. So that's going to kind of make it a little more curved. It's good to have uh, these backups uh, for Mozilla, and I think this is for Safari. Um, so these, these are for different browsers, uh, since it doesn't always work the same across all browsers uh, historically, but it might be changing these days. So this is what it looks like with just 10 pixels rounded corners. Um, but you could also make like different shapes uh, with like border radius top left and applying multiple values to the border radius too, um, to get different like rounded edges and different shapes and different kind of things like that. So you can do stuff like this, where it's just one corner is rounded, but the rest are, are not. You can make something that looks kind of like squiggly, and then you can make something that's circular as well. So let's kind of play around with that a little bit too. So let's add some padding in our h1, let's do 10 pixels. So that gives us some space around home page here. Let's do a height as well. I don't know, um, 200 pixels. So you can give it a height as well. If you don't give it a width, then it's going to be the full width of the browser window. Do text align, center. Border radius. Let's do 20 pixels. 
So let's kind of round it around the corners. We can add, just like with um, padding and margin, we can add uh, multiple values here. So if you want to do like 100, then it's going to do the 20 on this corner and this corner, and then 100 on this corner and this corner. Could do more, let's do 50 pixels. Uh, then this corner is 50 pixels. Let's do another one that's 200 pixels. Then this one is 200 pixels. Kind of play around with the shape. Let's play around with the border. Let's do one pixel dotted and green. Let's make it a little thicker. Let's do 10 pixels. Box shadow. Let's try that too. Let's try inset. Zero, zero, 20 pixels and dark cyan. Yeah, kind of looks like a jalapeno or something to me. <laughs> I don't know why. Let's try, let's try making these in line, these bullets. So I'm going to do li display in line. So because I did that, now they're um, next to each other. Uh, so that I think by default, um, unordered lists or lists in general are going to have uh, some padding over here. So we can do, let's try ul. Uh, padding zero pixels. Does that work? Yeah, but kind of fix that. Let's give uh, each one of these some some padding ten pixels and some margin of ten pixels. So now they have some like space around them. Let's do a border as well, just so we could see solid and white. So now you can see like the box itself physically has some padding around it and then some margin around it as well. So this is kind of starting to look more like um, like buttons, right? For like a navigation or something. So you could do something like that. Um, yeah, so there's lots of different things you can play around with. OK, so that said, um, I basically just want you to kind of play around with what we talked about today uh, and try to incorporate color and type and boxes like margins and paddings and borders and all of these different styles and parameters that we talked about today, uh, You know where it makes sense for, for your own um, designs and your own websites. So you should have already done like the HTML bits and linked all those pages together. Now you can play around with um, styling a little bit more. We haven't talked about layouts. We haven't talked about tables. We haven't talked about images yet. So, so just kind of uh, play around with color type and boxes for this week and apply it to the HTML pages that you've already created. Uh, on top of that, I also want you to read chapters 14 through 17 in the textbook, um, just to get an idea of, of what to expect for next week.